Okay, first of all, George Washington was our first president. What year is he elected? 1789. Okay, 1789. So he is different in the fact that no other president will have to be elected in, a, in an odd year. But he was elected. He's also our only one that was unanimous. What does that mean when, he, when you're elected unanimously? Not a single vote against. Right, everyone voted for him, Not, no one against him. Which, when, our, when we made the Constitution, they had one person in mind for it, which was George Washington. Um, he got elected, he's inaugurated, hopefully he's gonna save our country. Now, we have him on Mount Rushmore. So he's one of our greatest presidents. What do you do? Make sure we didn't sink. sink. What? Make sure we didn't sink. Make sure we didn't sink? Steady. Huh? Did you say that? He's our first. Steady. First. He's our first, should just be a first best. Yeah. First is the worst, second is the best. So then John Adams should be our best. Second to first loser, though. Yeah. And that's really what he did. Because we're, we can look at other ones that are on there. Abraham Lincoln right, got us through the Civil War. Franklin Roosevelt is one of our greatest presidents on there. Got us through World War II. Thomas Jefferson, Louisiana Purchase. Right, Teddy Roosevelt on there. The expansion that he did in the progressive era and helping out people. Um, we'll have Ronald Reagan in the 80s and the end of the Cold War. But this is where for George Washington, it's kind of like, all right, he was there. But the thing that he has is what's called precedent. And I don't give you a definition on there, but what exactly is precedent? Not president. He leaves like, um, like guidelines for the next, the next. Right, so basically guidelines is a good way to have it, an unofficial rule. Here's how you do things. Because since he is the first, who did he have to guide him or follow? Nobody. Yeah, no one. The closest that he has is a king. And how do we feel about a king? Bad boyfriend. Uh, and some of the precedents that he established. First of all, two terms. After two terms, he said, I'm gone. People wanted to make him president for life. And he said, no, that's a king. But he decided after two terms, no, I'm stepping away. Again, our nation is not supposed to be a nation of men. We're a nation of laws. John Adams would have that quote. And what he was meaning by that is it doesn't matter who's the head of it. We go by what our system is. All right, We replace with one to another. And we don't have to have a giant civil war he's showing there. Civil so thing has a handshake. President Obama walks in here right now. Y'all gotta get up and bow to him, right? And that's what when when that's what you normally did to kings and queens in, in those days. And when George Washington was made president, people started bowing. He said, "No, we're not doing that." Now I know all of you. If you were if you had someone going and they started bowing to you, all of you would be like, "No, no, no." What? Well, I mean, most of you are your ego. All right. If people were bowing to you, are you gonna say no? The difference is, if Obama walks in here, president of the United States. You greet him as Mr. President and a handshake. Not much difference than if the president of a bank walked in or a business person. All right, the only difference is Mr. President. Is that really that formal? Yeah, it, it distinguishes a little bit, but it's not at that extreme. And that's what George Washington starts. Well, I thought he didn't like shaking people's hands. What? I thought Washington didn't like shaking hands really. He was kind of a little bit aloof, but this is where but that idea, instead of bowing down, hands were. Where it at. But that's what some of the precedents that, that he would have. Yeah. Did Benjamin Franklin ever go to prison? No. Huh? Benjamin Franklin would pass away very soon after the Constitution was written. Um, he was on, I mean, in the Constitutional Convention, he was there physically, but realistically, mentally, there wasn't a whole lot that he contributed at that time. Um, it's just, he was on his final days. Benjamin Franklin's importance comes actually before the country and then in the independence movement. What do you have on his Facebook? Uh, uh, gout. Yeah, gout. Is that where we died? No. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't that. Be, I mean, he, would, he would die, I mean, 13, 14 years later. All right. Vice president, well, first of all, advisors. One of the precedents that, that George Washington would have is he would get a group of advisors. We already had set up in the Constitution the vice president. The way that it originally was set up is whoever was second in electoral voting would become vice president. 
if we still had that system today, who would be our vice president? McCain. Yeah, McCain. Which that actually, like some people, John McCain and Obama would actually get along. Right, yeah, in the campaign there were some things out of it, but the two of them really would get along. But before that, who would have been George W. Bush's vice president? Yeah, Al Gore. You think that would have worked out? I'm not sure if that one would be very peaceful. And this is what ended up happening. But when we first had our constitution, we did not have political parties. So it was just whoever was second place became vice president. Um, John Adams, even though there wasn't any vote for it, he became the second one. Yet it doesn't really matter if that's what happened. What is more important was our first cabinet. And this was a huge precedent that it had. George Washington selected people to give him advice and put them in powerful positions. Now I have the question on there. Is that in the Constitution? No. Not directly. Okay, the president's allowed to have advisors, but that again, that's why it's a, pres a precedent. George Washington says, I need for all these different things some people to advise me. And thus he made our first cabinet. Now his original cabinet had only four people in it. The two that you probably haven't heard of before are Secretary of War, Henry Knox. <laughs> Our Attorney General Edmund Randolph. Now, Secretary of War, what are they supposed to be in charge of? War. War. Today, do we have a Secretary of War? No, we have a Secretary of Defense. We're no longer war mongering. We're just defending ourselves. Yeah. That seems kind of ironic that we we'll switch that as we're involved more and more. You want to know what the Attorney General does? No, you're you're thinking of the Surgeon General. The the Attorney General basically is our top cop. Remember, the president, the executive branch, is to enforce the laws that Congress has. Well, this is the person has. Um, the Attorney General is in charge of the FBI. Okay, is in charge of ATF. Um, DEA, all these organizations to enforce laws. That's what the Attorney General. Yeah. Henry Knox, some of you might recognize the name Knox, but we have four Knox named after him. Um, Edmund Randolph, you notice this name Randolph keeps popping up. He's, that's one of those big families in Virginia, so it's another powerful in Virginia that we have. Those are the two more obscure ones. The two that you definitely need to know, though, are the first one is Jefferson as Secretary of State, and then Hamilton as Secretary of Treasury. What does the Secretary of State, what are they in charge of? States. Not states. Conducting the states. Nothing to do with the states of the United States. Talking to other countries. Talking to other countries. So Foreign yeah. affairs. That is where the Secretary of State is involved with other countries. What is our relationship with other countries? Today, Hillary Clinton is our Secretary of State. The President appoints the cabinet. Right. So, the President can't always talk with other countries. Obama can't go and discuss with these other countries, so that's where today we have Hillary Clinton as our Secretary of State, and she is one to be, then be in charge of that. Secretary of the Treasury, what are they involved with? Money. Yeah, money. And Alexander Hamilton would be the person that we would that would be the, um, our first secretary of the treasury. Today it's a guy by the name of Timothy Geithner. Uh, there we still have this have we still have all these positions except for a secretary of war. What would happen throughout history is we would make a secretary of the army and navy and then we would combine those together to make a secretary of defense in, in the nineteen forties after World War II. So does the cabinet change every single time the president's on? Even sooner than that. Because it could have if we have one of the one of the administrators we have, like Homeland Security, is our, our most recent cabinet post that we have. I think we're at 18 positions now in there. But if we were to have, have, um, I didn't do it was, but if, but if we have, have, this, have any position resign, the president can appoint them. Now it has to be approved by the Senate. We have our checks and balance system that, that would go, but that's where they have to be. Um, normally, if Obama wins the election, a lot of people will probably resign after that in the cabinet. Not that they disagree with them, but if you are, let's say Hillary Clinton, 
the last four years, how much has she been home? Many. Yes. I mean, she's going all over the world. Okay, so you you might decide, all right, I've had four years. All right, it's time for me to go for and and there. I'm going to resign. Not that I disagree with what you have. Um, the position that changes the most often is the attorney general. You are the top cop, but in the history of the United States, you're usually blamed for almost anything that goes wrong. <laughs> because, well, the FBI screw up sometimes, DEA. I mean, right now, our, our attorney general is Eric Holder. Some of you have heard of Fast and Furious, not the movie, but this was yeah. a, but this is with Fast and Furious, where it was brilliant plan that we were actually going to sell Weapons to the Mex right? yes okay. <laughs> okay yeah I'm being sarcastic there but we were going to sell weapons to basically Mexican drug lords we were going to trace these weapons and that way we were going to find a way now the plan actually in some ways there was some some good idea with it but we sell all these weapons which we lost track of and eventually what happened is some of these weapons were used in the killing of of American officers <laughs> so that's why there's an investigation where was the screw up and here and this is why I mean what sometimes have group think you have a group of people get around and you all think this great idea and no one's there with the common sense to say wait a minute all right we want to give automatic weapons to people that really don't care about killing it with others um, how much did Eric Holder actually have involved with this? I don't know um, in here, but he's the person getting blamed the most for it because he's Attorney General. Okay. Meanwhile, President Obama, all right, he's getting blamed blamed for it some also. He may not have even known about this. What you do as a president is you, you have to try to, when you get these advisors, you gotta get people you trust and people that are that you think are competent. And most of the bit problems that we've had in the history of the United States with presidents with scandals are when they got people that they did not have that were competent. Um, biggest, two biggest problems that we had were, were with guys that like to hire, hire their advisors to be their drinking buddies. Yes, your friends and the people you like to party with, all right, you might like them, but do you want to put them in a powerful position? And this is where for Grant um, and later on President Hardy, uh, there, we would have problems with them. All right, now we get to the part where these two, two parties and what the parts are. The cards are right now. The Democratic Republicans. Now, I'm not trying to trick you with this. The Democratic Republicans are today's Democrats. It's the forerunners of today's Democrats. But they were called Republicans. All right, again, that's kind of trivial, but they there. What you do need to know is they followed the ideas of what person? Jefferson. Yes, Thomas Jefferson. And here's where it kind of you're going to need to know. All right, here's the Democratic Republicans, the other group, the Federalists. Their basic belief is that we're going to have a small U.S. government. The powers are going to be to the states. That is their basic ideas. So then, technically, like the first three presidents are Democrats, or at least the second and third one. Well, actually, the third, fourth, fifth. You'll see. All right, other followers, Madison and Monroe. There are a lot more than that, but this is where I'm not trying to give you all a whole lot of them here. So Jefferson, who would be our third president, then the fourth president, the fifth president, they were all Democratic Republicans. Wait, so I'm confused. Are they actually Republicans, or are they Democrats today? They were the forerunners of today's Democratic Party. That They called themselves Republicans. Now, Why? That, that's just what they call a short. What we truly have is what will be today's Democrat Party um, would actually come about with Andrew Jackson. That's when we get to the second party system. They drop the name Republicans, and then they go by just Democrats at that time, and, that's, and they become more for the people um, at that time. But even there, this is where they're, they're, the Democratic Republicans were seen more for the common person. Um, you're going to see there are some things that are like Democrats, some things that are like Republicans with both these parties. We can't say that, oh yes, the Democratic Republicans, if you trace through history, that's just like the Democrats today. Because yes, there are some things, but there are some things that are completely opposite. The one, that, one biggest thing is they believe in a small federal government. The idea of today's Democrats is more of a larger federal government, where the Republicans today say power to the states. Okay, so this is where, again, it's, it's not exactly, exactly the same. Um, there with the two of them. 
Uh, they believe the for Jefferson believed that we should be a nation of small farmers. He said we should be agriculturally based. Why? Why? Why should we be based on agriculture? And that's it. If we do not have to depend on another nation in the world for our food, can we survive? Yeah. And that's basically Jefferson's idea. We are just, we take care of ourselves. We don't have to be dependent on anybody else. We can take care of the other things in other ways there. But number one thing is, let's be able to feed ourselves. And if we're a bunch of small, independent farmers, we don't have a bunch of rich people, we don't have businesses controlling things. And there, um, word, and you'll see it later on, yeoman farmers. All right, yeoman are the small farmers. Obviously, support the rural areas would like that idea. If you're a farmer, do you want someone that supports farming and agriculture? Yeah. Okay, so this is where it makes sense that they would have that. So the rural areas is where the support was. But it didn't really go well because there's not really many people in the area. No, at that time though, 90% of Americans were farmers. So nine out of 10 Americans were farmers. Most of our, or the, the biggest areas that were almost all farms, well, the South, remember their economy and the, and the colonies was based on agriculture, so they would. And then West, as we were moving out West, why were we moving out West? For land, to do what? Farm. To farm. So doesn't it make sense that those are the people that are gonna support them? Now, if you look at that, though, as we keep expanding, does the power of his party keep growing? So that's part of what will end up happening um, for the Democratic Republicans and why they keep growing is because as we expand, we're expanding more people that have their ideas. They're supported more by the common man, and again, I use this word, the yeoman farmers. Small, independent farmers is what a yeoman farmer is. In foreign affairs, Jefferson says we need to support France. They supported us, we need to support them. He believed in that Franco-American alliance. We should continue on with it. All right, they helped us in our time of need. We need to help them. Um, needless to say, he was our ambassador to France in the beginning of our country. So he had a closer relationship to France anyways. This part was a strict interpretation of the Constitution. We are going to go into the interpretation after we go through the other side. And there it seems difficult, but it really isn't. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to explain that separately. But remember with him, he has strict interpretation. Now for the other side, the Federalist Party. Not to trick you, but here's tricky. Remember we had the Federalists and Anti-Federalists in the last section. This is a whole other group of Federalists. Even though Hamilton was a Federalist, if you remember, Madison used to be a Federalist. Is he a Federalist now? He's a Democratic Republican now. So these are two different ideas. The first Federalist, Anti-Federalist were with the Constitution. Now we're with political parties. The idea that Hamilton had is that we should have a large federal government. Now here's where I was saying that we're a little bit different from today. The reason why I said we should have a large federal government is the fact that we needed to support business because we need to have a government to help out businesses. Other supporters will be John Adams. And why did I put a question mark by George Washington? Maybe. And that's basically it. Officially, George Washington was no party. But when we look back in history, guess which way he leaned? Yeah, towards Hamilton's ideas. They followed the ideas of the But that's why for Washington, officially, he is not a Federalist. Unofficially, he leans that way. And he does more things towards Federalists than he will for Jefferson. So our test will be boosted. You, and when I do a quiz with that, you can put either way. I'll accept either one, one with that. If you say Federalist, I'll say, hey, you're right. If you say no party, you're right. Okay, it's, um, it's the Yeah, that way you would be wrong. Believe the economy should be manufacturing and trading. Yeah. So aren't the Federalists now kind of like the Federalist the Constitution? Well, you say Republicans now? Well, this is the formation of the Federalist Party. No, I mean, are they the Federalists? 
like during Hamilton or whatever, like in this exact same ones that one in some ways, yes, like but there were some that weren't. That's why it's not exactly the same thing. But yeah, there are some similar, but there's also differences. All right, believe that we should be manufacturing and trading. Jefferson says a nation of small farmers. Hamilton says we want to be a great nation. The greatest nation in the world at that time was still Britain. Well, let's follow what they do. Areas of support, urban. The cities are going to, especially coastal areas. Where are your factories located? The cities. Where are your trading net net networks? In the cities. So that's where it's natural to happen. Area most, they guess most of the port, the north and the east, the one region that was strongest would be New England. That is where most of our manufacturing is, most of our trading is, is in the north and the east, or New England area. That's the opposite. Right. Supported by the rich, the elite, the educated. Here's what's kind of ironic. Jefferson was supported by the common man and wanted to do things for the common man, yet Jefferson was raised as a very rich, elite person in Virginia. Meanwhile, Hamilton says that the common people, they're not smart enough to be doing it. All right? If you're a leader, you need to be educated, you need to be rich. All right? You gotta show that you've already had something. Meanwhile, Hamilton, Hamilton himself, he was an orphan child. Um, basically, almost sort of adopted. Well, first of all, a really sad life with him early on because almost everybody that he was associate, associated with died. Okay, his mother would die. His uncle adopts him. His, his uncle dies. I mean, he just. I mean, you're talking about everything. But he was absolutely brilliant. So is Jefferson. Both of them are two of the most brilliant men in American history. On um, there, but here. For Hamilton, the way that he ended up becoming one of the wealthiest men was by Jefferson's idea. Meanwhile, Jefferson is fine for something for Hamilton. I mean, they were kind of doing the opposite for each other of who they said should be there. But Hamilton didn't trust people that weren't educated or rich. Um, foreign affairs, he said, we should be with Britain. If Britain is the greatest manufacturing and trading, we should be friends with them. Yeah, we did, but they're still our cousins. Can you have a fight within your family and still? No, I have a fight. <laughs> now we're All right. Now to lose interpretation <laughs> here. Now to get for the interpretation. First of all, I don't think it's written on your note packet. Write the words construction. This is on the top of the next page here. Sometimes it will say loose interpretation. Sometimes it will say loose construction. Those words are interchangeable. That's why I'm getting ready to talk to you. That's why, that's why I said I'm trying to take this to explain. The part that you had before, Jefferson is strict interpretation, Hamilton is loose interpretation. Now, for a strict interpretation, this is Jefferson and the Democratic Republicans, you're only allowed to do whatever the Constitution says you are allowed to do. If it's stated in there, you're allowed to do it. If it's not stated, you can't do it. Meanwhile, for Hamilton's view, and the Federalists took this, unless it says you're not allowed to do it, then you are allowed to do it. The easy way that some of you might know this is with your parents' rules. Your parents probably have a strict interpretation of the rules, and you have a loose interpretation of the rules. Okay? You tell your parents that you're going to the Inverness Mall, Walmart. Um, and and then then you're going to go to a movie. Well, you get to the Eminence Mall of Walmart, and you meet some friends up there, and they decide, well, let's let's go out, and we're going to go out into the the and admire nature out in the middle of the woods somewhere. So you go with your friends because you love to be out in the middle of the woods on a Friday or Saturday night with your friends admiring nature. Now, your parents said that you were allowed to go to the mall and then to the movies and then you come home. Well, you went to the mall and you're coming home. They didn't say you couldn't go out with your friends. So you have a loose interpretation, they have a strict interpretation. And that's kind of where the difference comes in. Jefferson, remember, wants a small government. So they can only do a small amount of things if they have a strict interpretation. 
Hamilton, meanwhile, wants a loose interpretation because he wants to support all these businesses and those things. All right, the courts. Now I'm going to kind of fill in a whole bunch of little things in here that have to do with the things in the beginning, but we won't actually get to most George Washington's first presidency until the next part. So this next section is kind of like a hodgepodge of things. Quickly go through. Um, if we were to look at the Constitution, Article 1 is about the legislative branch. It's half the Constitution. They knew what they wanted to do. Uh, in your textbook, it would be about three to four pages. Then it would be like one page on the executive branch and what the president is. Then they have basically a paragraph about the judicial branch. They weren't sure exactly what they wanted. Well, the Judiciary Act of 1789, it told what they were going to do. It sets up the court systems the same way that we have today. We just have more courts, but it set it up with tiers of district courts, appeals courts, and eventually the Supreme Court being on the top. Uh, originally, there would be five justices on the Supreme Court. Today, we have nine. It went up and down for a while, but for over 100 years now, we've had it, had it at nine, and it's probably going to stay at nine. Because the last time we tried to tinker with this, this was when Franklin Roosevelt was doing it, we basically said, no, this, we're not going to make this a political thing. So it probably is going to stay at nine unless something dramatic happens. Here's one of the most obscure amendments to know of, but this is where we have a problem in the beginning. Our Constitution is a rule book. Can you sometimes write rule, a rule book and forget a rule? Yeah. Or you had something you didn't answer. And that's basically what the 11th Amendment was. We didn't really have what the rules were about one state suing another state or something like that. Now, why would one state sue another state? <laughs> well, you know the big one of the biggest issues we have is over water. Okay. Um, two years ago, Florida we su we sued Georgia over water. Yes. Okay. Should that case go into Florida court or Georgia court? <laughs> or we're Florida. We we went into Florida court, right? Yeah. Where does Georgia want? The Eleventh Amendment says since it's two states, it's going to go to a federal court. Now, what we were suing them over. There, is a, there are two rivers that flow, flow together. Flint River from Alabama, the Chattahoochee River, and Georgia. They flow together, make Lake Seminole. Those of you bass fishermen, great bass fishing lake. Then it, and that forms to make the, um, the Apalachicola River, which then flows down, down to Apalachicola Bay. Anyone know what Apalachicola Bay is famous for? Fish. What type of fish? Trout <laughs> What did you say? Redfish? Okay. Oysters. Shellfish. Mm -hmm. Basically about three quarters of the oysters that we consume as Americans come out of Apalachicola Bay. Mm -hmm. Now, for the oysters, you need to have it at a certain amount of salinity. Georgia went through a prolonged drought and they were taking more and more water out of the Chattahoochee River. Which if they're taking water out of the Chattahoochee River, that's less fresh water flowing into the Apalachicola Bay which was raising the salinity up and up and up. If it got too high, it would kill the oysters. Now, people in Atlanta like to drink water. Okay, So they want to have that water from, from the Chattahoochee River. But at the same time, downstream, we needed that water. So that's why Florida was suing Georgia, saying you can't take all the water that's flowing in there because you will kill what is a lot of jobs plus a source of food for, for people in Florida as well as America um, in there. Um, they basically worked out a compromise to make sure that there is safely enough water that is being released on there. But that's where when they went through a prolonged drought. So that's how sometimes you can have a suit between two states. But that's all the 11th Amendment did. Kind of set up those rules. All right, Hamilton's influence. He would write two things. The reports on manufacturers. Guess what the report of manufacturers was a report about? On manufacturers? Wow, you're smart. Huh? How did you ever figure that out? What's manufacturers? Company and stuff that builds stuff. Yeah, stuff that build, things that build it, industries, things like that. Um, he pushes for tariffs and excise taxes. First of all, what is a tariff? A tax. On something coming in. On something coming in. Right, something coming in. Now, in con our Constitution, it can be something coming out, but our Constitution says we're not allowed to tax, tax exports. So it's only on an import. An excise tax is a tax on a specific item. In other, and in this case, what he was pushing for was a tax on alcoholic beverages. 
Okay, we, we have a gas tax. We have we have a alcohol tax. We have a cigarette tax. Yeah, but you said you, you can't tax stuff going out. Is that kind of like how duty free works? No, well, duty free is coming in. Duty free would mean you don't have to even tax what's coming in. There's certain areas that we tax certain things. Now, why did Hamilton want these taxes? It would have to be the army. Taxes help the economy. Mm -hmm. Are you a Democrat? <laughs> Well, what is to pay for debt? Because the United States owed a debt. Are other countries going to to respect us if we don't pay off our debt? Because so that's one reason. alcohol, and he knew that they would still drink alcohol if we tax it. But, but shouldn't we as Americans be able to drink without paying a tax? We don't like tax, remember? That's why we broke away from Britain. So, and here's where kind of when I was joking about the states for a Republican, and here. If we tax more, can the government be bigger? Yeah. If they have more money coming in. Who wanted a bigger government? Yeah. Hamilton. So if we have taxes, he can have a bigger government. Meanwhile, Jefferson is saying for a smaller government. Okay? He doesn't want these type of things. So that is part. And part of it was, again, to pay off our debts that we had. Uh, that we can only sell so much land out west. Remember that? That's where the land ordinance was one of the only ways that we were able to get some money coming in or up there. Are you afraid that they're going to do like a, like a sugar tax on stuff because now that they're trying to get rid of the 16 ounce things? Um, I don't know if that, that will matter. That is like, we'll stay on this right now. So. Yeah, don't, don't get me caught on things oh, for yeah. government right now. All right. Y'all are history. All right, report on public credit. This one's not quite so obvious, but basically what, when you see the word credit, what should you be thinking of? Plastic. Uh, <laughs> fake money. Plastic, fake money, but dealing with money in there. Which, what deals with money? Treasury. Uh, Treasury, uh, banks. Now, Hamilton says we need a national bank. Which here, get used to the bus, Bank of the United States. Because it's going to come up over and over again. But he says we need the bus. The other thing he said is we need to get the debts from all these states. We need to combine it together and pay it off. Um, I'm going to come to that section in a little bit in there. Hamilton said we needed a national debt. Why would a national debt be good? How many of you have a reason to keep getting taxes? Well... That would be for taxes and the government powerful. Here's where you can't think today. Our debt that we owe, that was that owed, basically the people that we, the United States government would owe that money to, were rich Americans. If you are a rich American and you loan, let's say, millions of dollars to the U.S. government, do you want to see that government fail? No. So that's what his idea was. If the richer Americans had to pay off that or would be the people that we'd be paying our debt to, they would be supportive of this government. Now, I don't think that Alexander Hamilton was thinking of $17 trillion as debt. And most of our debt is actually owed to Americans. The bigger problem that we have now is every year, more and more of our debt is owed to China and other countries. But, but still, majority. any of you have a savings bond? That's the U.S. government owing you money. Okay, the bond is a loan. All right, we're going to go ahead and stop there. I know this makes you sad that two nights in a row that you're not going to have any formal homework. Oh, and here, we didn't get to it because we don't have, we had it finished. So the Hamilton, Jefferson, Franklin, the incredible minds that we had, all would be at one time. Now, the report on manufacturers gave his plan that he had for what we should do for industry. He said, said for his Federalist Party, his idea is one that would be for industry, and the tariffs would support that, the excise taxes, would help that out. It would make a bigger government, which would give more support for it. Report on public credit, you need to be thinking of, of the banks, the national bank, and the assumption of debt. Now, why did I say that Hamilton says we should have a national debt? Because rich, take, uh, rich people would be less money Right. If, they, if the government owed them money, they would support it. So it's kind of a way to making sure that the rich... Realistically, Hamilton looked at things and said, we had a revolution that was of the rich people breaking away. Well, let's make sure the rich people don't break away from this government they're setting up. Let's basically go from in. Now, assumption. This is the part I didn't go into yesterday. 
I have a question. Why did the assuming of states that upset the southern states? See, Hamilton's plan was to take all the individual states together, put all the debts into one big pot, and they're going to pay it off together. Well, it wasn't that they weren't rich. Actually, Virginia was the richest of everyone. They didn't know as much. So here's basically what was happening is we're all going to be one big happy family. Sorry, you have to be. Okay? But we're going to be one big happy family. We're going to put all our debts together now. Chris, you owe $5,000. Matthew, you owe $100,000. Hey, Sarah, you owe, you owe zero. Um, in here. But we're going to put all our debts together and pay it off as one big happy family. Sound good to you, yeah. Matthew? Yeah. Sarah, how about you? Sure. Sure? Yeah, but you have to help no. Me. no. Yeah, now you're going to help pay off Matthews. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. The southern states or the southern states were the ones that had already paid off their debts. Do they want to have to go and pay New York's debt off? New York was one that hadn't been so good at paying off their debts. Meanwhile, Virginia, South Carolina, they've done a better job. What are their debts were it came from, like, the from the Revolutionary War. From like the fighting? Yeah. So you have to pay the army. So that's what they're going to put together. So the southern states are saying no. Now Hamilton's from New York. Is he going to be helping out New York? Yeah. yeah he's got to. It'd be kind of like if Matthew was the one writing up our Constitution and our rules, it might benefit him a little more. Yeah, let's pay off this debt. That sounds like a great idea. Yeah. All right. Someone like Chris, well, you know, it's here in the middle. All right, you're probably going to be paying it anyways. But if you're where Sarah was, I, mean, I already did everything right. Why should I get it? So the southern states got something in return. What did they get in return? They get... Washington, D.C., the District of Columbia. They're going to move the capital. Where the capital will go from Philadelphia, New York, now it's going to be made permanent in the District of Columbia. There was a tract of land, part in Maryland, part in, in Virginia. Now, you notice the shape of it? It's a square or a diamond, depending on which way you angle it. Now today we actually have a bite taken out of it because when Virginia broke away in the Civil War, that part was then withdraw from it. But for the District of Columbia, and we actually have, like for some people, they actually have the survey markers from when they, they went out and originally surveyed this. They have the have the markers that you can go and find for the original points that you have. What yeah. 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 Well, they got but the capital was moved south. It's. Even though it's on the border of Virginia, Maryland's kind of considered a southern state, state there. So, but that's what they get in return. They want it closer to there. Virginia, they want the capital right there where they have the, the closest thing that the say so is. Why do they carve it out? Why don't they just say it's in one state? That's, I mean, that's, where they, and that's why they kind of took from both states. That was part of the idea that it wasn't just one state. It was an area where not many people lived. Well, actually, where Washington was it was a giant swamp. Okay. Which see if it was really good land you'd have to take it away from people. Alright, it was real easy to get that land because not many people were living there at that time. So that's why they ended up taking it. But that's what the South got in return for the assumption of the debts. Alright, the bus. The bus arrives, okay, the wheels of the bus go round and round. Um first bank in the United States, it was very controversial. It would be chartered for 20 years. After that 20 years, we will end up where it's rechartered. There's not a whole lot of problem in the rechartering of it. Mm -hmm. Rechartered means we're going to let you go for another 20 years. Now, what you're going to find out later on is then when it goes for its third time for rechartering at the second second bank of the United States when it's going to when it's up for rechartering again, then there'll be a little problem when a guy by the name of Andrew Jackson is around and he doesn't like the bus. But the first time there's some arguments on it. This is the most controversial of everything has. Although there's a lot of things people didn't like um, in there um, uh, for Hamilton's plan. This is one at now one other part, there's one part in his report to manufacturers that actually wasn't approved of. I don't have this in the notes. But one thing that he wanted, he actually wanted some taxpayer money to go to help out industries. And they said no, we would, they would never do that. But he asked for a tariff, they got that. He asked for a bank, they got that. They asked for excise taxes, they would get that. Um, so most everything that Hamilton said we should do, he actually got. 
over there. But the part where we're actually going to give government assistance to industries, we said no. Which today, this is where that's the line of socialism. Uh, where, and this is where you kind of look at the Federalists were more friendly to business. Today we say that government is more, or that Republicans are more friendly to business. But this is where it's a different idea. At that time, businesses wanted government help. Today they're saying for government to step out. All right, less regulation. Um, what is the job of the of the Bank of the United States? Currency flowing. All right, and keep it flowing. And how? But what what's one thing they want to control? The economy. The amount of money out there. Inflation. All right, and this is where they come. Inflation's one thing to worry about. And this even goes back to Shay's Rebellion. Okay, his, we're afraid. If you have a lot, you don't want inflation too much. You want a small amount of inflation. A healthy economy, you will have inflation. But you don't want it to go too fast because when it goes too fast, then things get out of control because people start panicking. Uh, if, if you think that prices are going to go up dramatically from this week to next week, you're going to buy a lot. Yeah, you're going to buy a lot, and basically you're not going to save things um, there. So there's some things that we know. I mean, we know that there are certain things that over time, gas is going to keep going up uh, there, which right now, hopefully, is going to be going down. But some of the prices in the Mideast all right, make it for the next two months. It might actually, where it's supposed to go down the next couple of weeks, all right, that might end up making it actually stay in the same, where it would have been going down because we go to the fall blend um, here in the next two weeks. But, but that's where the, bu the bus was. Today, do we have a Bank of the United States? No. Yeah, we do. We don't call the, it the bank, not the treasury. The mints. No, not the mints. It's called the Federal Reserve or the Fed. And they actually, we had last Thursday or Friday, they announced what is called QE3, quantitative easing three. And what they're actually doing is they're magically saying there's more money. It will make higher inflation, which will actually even though inflation isn't good in many ways, it'll actually help with some things for the housing market and for some things with debt that the nation has. Now, for a lot of normal people, it does mean because gas, oil prices are hooked to the U.S. dollar, it does make it where the, the dollar is weaker. Um, it will also mean that food prices will go up. So for a common person, QE3 may not be as good, but for businesses and for the nation as a whole, it might be. And there, and we've had the last two, which is part of the reason why a lot of food prices have gone up over the last five years. Who is that like inflation? Do we ever have deflation? The last time we had deflation was back in the Great Depression. Do we want deflation? Mm. No. Inflation is good as long as it's small. Deflation is really bad. We almost, and that's one reason why we did that quantitative easing. That's one reason why it started with George W. Bush. It was not Obama. All right, that, that had that, but it was actually Bush that started that. In some ways, it is part of what some economists say are, have helped us get out of our housing crisis today, um, which it has made food prices and gas prices higher, but it saved the economy, and this is where we didn't have the deflation that we had. Again, the last time we had that was the Great Depression, and we know that's a little depressing time that we don't want to go back to. Ask any old person if you're by them, they'll tell you about. Why is it bad? Because like the value of dollars goes up, and then so you can't afford to buy anything. Well, what ends up happening is, and then this is where there's even more uncertainty. One reason why we went to our great recession this last time is the the value of property dropped so dramatically. Now, the reason why it dropped was because it was inflated too much. It was a balloon, and then the balloon popped, and it came back more realistic. I mean, here in Citrus County, Citrus Springs, we had pieces of property that in 1990. Five, we're selling for five thousand dollars a lot. Two thousand, they're selling for seven, eight thousand dollars a lot. And two thousand and five, they're selling for eighty thousand dollars a lot. <laughs> Did they really become that much more valuable in that five-year period? All right, which now they're back down to seven, eight, ten thousand dollars—a realistic price that we had. It's just pieces of paper, and whoever was holding the piece of paper last, you lost there. Um, and that's what happened. Some people for their houses, they we had it where it was. Cheap credit. All right, Jeff? Uh, yeah. Um, in the Federal Reserve, that's what it's called, right? Yeah. Is there, uh, I thought there was oil, um, like gold, too. Like they no, we have, well, no, the, no, we do have a strategic reserve. That's what you might uh, be yeah. We have actually, we set aside some oil, uh -huh. which in case there was a national emergency to make sure if, if every place didn't have it, that we have some stored up. 
which at times that President Obama has considered getting some of that out, which would ease prices for a short moment. All right, it's not a long-term fix. I mean, you could basically say for a couple of weeks that we might have gas 10 cents a gallon less. All right, it's not a solution to the problem if we if we drop some of that and we go back up. Well, so. that's enough oil for like three years if we just rely on it. So. That's part of what the strategic reserve is, yeah, to make sure that we have that. All right, the Whiskey Rebellion. We have an excise tax. The tax is on alcoholic products, but the main alcoholic product would be whiskey. <laughs> Hamilton had called for this. Notice the Revenue Act. Revenue, when you see revenue, that actually when revenue comes into the government, that is taxes. Uh, but we would have this tax on whiskey. Made the farmers upset in West Western Pennsylvania. Why? They like whiskey. They like whiskey. Whiskey is good, right? Okay. Now, this is where, yes, some of those farmers, they like to drink it. That's not a problem because if they're drinking it, they're not paying the taxes on it. What the farmers liked is it was a way, one of their only ways to really make money. If I'm a corn farmer, you're 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 a corn farmer. Are you going to buy my corn? No. No. So who am I going to be selling my extra corn to? You're a non-corn farmer. Right. And they're not living around me. So if I'm in western Pennsylvania and I have to go and load up my wagon with corn and drive a couple days away to Philadelphia and sell my corn, that's how I can make some extra money. Of course, if I was to take that corn and make it into whiskey and take, instead of a wagon full of corn, I take a wagon full of bottles of whiskey, what's going to sell for a lot more money? Whiskey. So this is where for the farmers, I can take one trip with some whiskey and make a lot more money than if I was to go with multiple trips with the corn. So it's, and that's where, but, and it wouldn't have to, to do as much. So that's where it was a source of their income. Plus they didn't like the idea of it because remember we as Americans, we don't like paying taxes. So they started yelling no taxation without representation. But they're getting representation now. Like Shay's Rebellion? Right. Well, Shay's Rebellion. I said, how is this like Shay's Rebellion? It's a tax. They don't want to pay it. It's also, notice that this is the rural areas. And this is where, I mean, it's, we're, we're semi-rural here in Inverness, but so notice that we had Bacon's Rebellion. We would have Shay's Rebellion, the Paxton Boys, now the Whiskey Rebellion. We have farmers farm. in the rural areas. And they're saying, we're not, we don't want to do this. But I have a question, how did it turn out different? The tax stayed. Why did it stay? Because they lowered it, they made compromise. No, there was no compromise with it. The military came in. Okay, the military came in. So we're not going to fight the U.S. Army when we fought the Redcoats? Well, except for the farmers didn't fight them. Did they chicken out? Yeah. And here's where we get some difference. Our new government, we have three branches. The legislative branch that makes the laws. They pass the Revenue Act. What is the executive branch supposed to do? Enforce it. Enforce the laws. Who's the head of the, the executive branch? Uh, the President General. George something. The President George Washington. And he sends out the army, but not only does he send out the army, he personally leads it. <laughs> and when the farmers go, when they hear the army coming, they're ready to fight. But when they see Washington, they went and they said, whoa, wait a minute. This must be something important. And they decide not to fight. What does that tell you about the respect for George Washington? It's one of those things that's kind of, okay, if George Washington says this is what we should do, then maybe we should. Now, do presidents go out and personally enforce the law today very often? Yeah. But that's where, and this is something that George Washington, George Washington could have said, I'm going to stay here and in the Capitol and send the army out, take care of the problem. But no, he got out there and by him personally getting involved, he solved this problem, which this is sometimes set out as the first test of the Constitution. 
but you see the pictures of it. And you'll see the famous white horse that at Washington. And we're going to watch a video in a second. They'll tell a little bit about his horse also, or what Washington did. All right. Officially, Washington was not a part of any, either party. I have on here, how did he seem to lean to the Federalist side? Yeah, yeah, Jefferson's from Virginia. Yeah, property. Well, well, basically, Congress is at that time was kind of doing whatever Washington says is best. Hamilton said we need excise tax. Do we have an excise tax? Yes, we end up with the, that on alcohol. He says we need a bus. Do we get a bus? Yes. Right. Basically, most everything that Hamilton's saying that we need, we get. The only, again, about the only thing that Hamilton says that we need that we don't get is where he says we need for factories, they get some taxpayer money. We say, ah, no to that. We didn't have socialism written down at that time, but that's basically for America. We were saying we're not going to have socialism. And so even though officially he wasn't any party, he is a federalist for the most part. Most of everything that Washington did was. Now, Jefferson said that we need to be an agricultural nation. A nation of small farmers, self-sufficient. Are we an agricultural nation? How many, yeah, of you, how many of you are farmers? How many are going to go into agriculture? So you really should. It's actually one of the booming things that we have. There. Really? Yes, yeah. it is one of the top things right now. It's one that there. They, we need more people to major in agriculture. It's, and it's not what some people think of as a farm. And of our exports are not one basically one of the number one export that, that we have in, in America today is grain. We are exporting food to other places. And here's where I want you to take it. If you take all the food that we have for Americans and we think we're a rich nation, we have a lot of stuff. If every place in the world cut us off of all the food they were sending to us, there are a few things in the American diet that we would end up having. Now, some of you might think that they'll be devastating. But for the most part, actually, what would you say? Bananas. Bananas would be. Now, we could grow bananas in Florida, but what are our bananas like? They're little ones. They're not as big. But So we're going to get them from Costa Rica and places like that. But, but we can go, but they wouldn't be as high of quality. We grow, yeah, we have potatoes. Yeah, I don't know what I'm there. For Florida, we have spuds today. What? We get chocolate. Chocolate. We won't be able to get any high quality chocolate. That'd be terrible. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's there. We can do other things. We can have all the sugar side, but we wouldn't have the high quality of the of the chocolate that we have. There's one other thing that we wouldn't coffee. be able to yeah, coffee would be the other thing. I know for some of you I would drink coffee. For some of you that might be devastating. And I don't think you and some people think the world wouldn't go on. But for the most part, a lot of stuff that we have is just simply that we're so rich. What would happen was there would be some times of the year that we couldn't get any and every fruit or vegetable that we want. There would be some, there would be a there would be a couple months of the year we couldn't get apples because we're not flying them in from other parts of the world. I mean, when we go to Publix and you or Sweet Bay or whatever grocery store and you go into the fruit and vegetable department, look and see where they all come from other parts of the world. It's not that we don't grow it; it's that we want it at all times of the year. Okay? And so we wouldn't be able to in the middle of the winter to maybe have as many fresh vegetables in there. Although most of the places we good. That's where Florida used to grow a lot more vegetables. When you go down to where Miami is in the homestead area of Miami, that's where in the winter the vegetables used to go. They put them on the train and send them up to Boston, New York, in that area. Uh, it, was there, it was an agricultural community. Uh, even this area of, of Florida here used to be for corn. You would have different areas. Selwood corn nearby uh, an apaca um, would, would be harvested in April. And that way people could have fresh corn in other areas, get on the train. So the one thing that we do agriculturally now for the United States is if it's labor intensive, we don't do as much. Florida, we used to have around Tampa Bay over 25 major tomato farms. We're now down less than five. Well, then, the reason being is tomatoes have to be hand picked. It's labor intensive. We basically have it, that's where, for Mexico or someplace like that, we'll have them where it's cheaper labor to do it. Meanwhile, 
And this is where I have this question, how do they actually work together? The reason why we are pretty much truly the number one agricultural nation in the world. So the nation is an agricultural nation, I did then die? It no. didn't, it's just in a different way. What makes us so great in agriculture is our industry. You can pick them more off that. Well, we, again, we don't do as much for the labor intensive. We let the countries that will pay for cheaper amount. Um, I, I have family that's out in Kansas, and I remember when I was little, the wheat above my head. And I hadn't been out in, in Kansas for, for several years um, during, during the summertime. And I went back out, out of, after like 10 years or something, I went, and the wheat was about this high. Uh, and I'm wondering to myself, either I'm imagining that the wheat used to be above my head and was really short. How is it that the wheat, and I asked my grandfather about it, he said, no, no, it used to be, I mean, it would get up like this high. Now it's here. You can farm more if that often? Certain season, No. Now they grow better. We genetically engineer to make the stalk shorter because all that area in between is not what you use. We made the stalk shorter. Did we have to use as much fertilizer? Did as much break in the wind? No. So we became more efficient and per acre we had a higher yield in there. Texas A&M University, I believe, made a hybrid of that. All right. We just shortened the stalk. Um, Kansas wheat farmers, right now I saw the one thing, um, I remember I showed the one video that one time on the farmer and I grow it. Yes. Okay. Well, those Kansas wheat farmers, most of them aren't going to be getting on a tractor in the future. They're going to be sitting at a computer and they have it. We already have the fields and you see this picture of it. We have it where there's GPS on the tractors. As they are harvesting it, it is constantly, every square meter of the field is plotted and it goes through with an analysis of how much wheat they are getting every section of the field. The next year, when they put down fertilizer, instead of just doing a broad thing of fertilizer, the areas that need more fertilizer, they put more. Areas that need less, they don't have to do as much, which is better for the environment. Fertilizer is one of the most expensive things that you can ever have um, there. So you are <coughs> saving, for each farmer, talking about tens of thousands of dollars by not over-fertilizing areas. Um, and they're going to be able, they already have it for, the, for a lot of the farms out there, which they're in probably within 10 years, most of the farms go this way. You're not gonna have someone driving the tractor. You're gonna be at a computer and it's almost like a computer game. So you gamers out there, all right, you can train for this job to be a farmer. But it's going to be GPS guided in that field that they are harvesting it. And so one person could be actually driving four tractors at a time. Um, again, one, one Kansas wheat farmer I've seen signs out there feeds like 15,000 people. And, so, and again, it's our technology. What are we doing with different things? Um, and that's a farm. Why do we have such great technology and such great farm and such great industry? Hamilton. So Hamilton actually made it for Jefferson. Now here's the scary thing for you. If we have that much technology, do we need as many farmers? And that's part of what we have for this next couple decades. Our technology is eliminating more and more jobs. So you better have the skills to do the jobs they are, or you're out of luck. Yeah, you better have that and be able to program it and be ready to change it. All right, so that'll be the end of the notes from yesterday. Turn to the very next page and do the eighth grade worksheet that you have right there. Newspaper headlines.